Hi, this is Janet Braun for Nursing Health Promotion. Welcome to Competency 9, Care of Children on Immunization for Children. The textbook material to go with this is London Chapter 45. The development of vaccines was a very significant breakthrough of modern medicine, providing immunity that was able to prevent the transmission of communicable disease and thus save people's lives. As early as 1796, we had the development of the smallpox vaccine, but then not until 1921 did we see diphtheria vaccine. In 1952, Dr. Jonas Salk developed the polio vaccine, and not until 1963 did we have the measles vaccine. Let's start by talking a little bit about immunity. Immunity can be either active or passive. Active immunity is longer lasting immunity. It's when the person's immune system has to actively make antibodies against the specific disease or antigen. It can be either naturally acquired immunity when the person has had the disease itself and produces antibodies against that disease, or the active immunity can be artificially acquired when the pathogen is injected into the child such as a Vi virus vaccine and the body then makes antibodies against that vaccine. Passive immunity is not as long lasting and in passive immunity the antibodies are given to the person rather than being made by their immune system. So passive immunity can also be naturally acquired when the child receives antibodies from its mother across the placenta when the baby is in utero or through the mother's breast milk through breastfeeding. Passive immunity can be artificially acquired when antibodies themselves in the form of immune globulins are injected into the person for rapid immunity. We do this for a number of diseases including hepatitis B immune globulin for babies who have been exposed to the hepatitis B virus through their mother. The Centers for Disease Control Immunization Schedule is the schedule used by um, the American Academy of Pediatrics and American Academy of Family Practitioners. It includes a catch-up schedule for children who are behind on their vaccines. Some information to help guide us is on these next two slides. So as we look at this information, you should be looking at the CDC immunization schedule. And that schedule is in the London book on pages 1197 and 1198. And it's also posted in PDF form on the website. You can look at the CDC website or print your PDF copy in color, which is probably the best idea, then you'll have it to study. So just a few ideas here to sort of sum up immunization guidelines. Hepatitis B vaccine is the only one that is started at birth. The first immunization is given in the first day or so after birth, usually at the hospital for most babies. At two months then, the second hepatitis B is given along with the DTAP, the Hib vaccine, the pneumococcal PCV, and the inactivated polio virus, IPV. So you'll want to look at the names of these different vaccines and understand what they are. And you'll see underneath the immunization schedule all of the detailed guidelines that the CDC publishes with each of these schedules. The next one is rotavirus. This is not given before six weeks and it is not started in any child that's older than 15 weeks. So we don't see it being given as commonly as the other ones. The varicella and measles, mumps, and rubella vaccines are both live virus vaccines, and that's an important thing to know. They have to be reconstituted to give them, and they have living virus in them. So both of those vaccines are scheduled with the first dose at 12 months of age, but not a day before, and the second dose before the child enters school at age four or five years old. The meningococcal vaccine can be given as early as age two, but we more often see it being given at 11 or 12 years of age. On this next slide, the DTAP vaccine, diphtheria, tetanus, and acellular pertussis is the one that's given through age six for those diseases. 
After age six, then we switch to the Tdap vaccine, and you probably all have had your Tdap vaccine, and this is recommended then for the first dose at age 11 to 12, and a Tdap booster then every five to 10 years after that in the person's life. The influenza vaccine is an annual vaccine. Depending on which type, it can be started at two years of age, or the other type at six months of age. And the human papilloma virus, HPV, to prevent cervical cancer, can be started at ages 11 or 12. This slide gives a list of common signs and symptoms of mild immunization reactions. Drowsiness, irritability, low grade temperature, redness or tenderness, or a lump formation at the site of the injection. These are common reactions. There also can be serious reactions, although they are quite rare, and there is a National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program that has been developed. Part of this program is the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System, which um, has forms that go with it. They are posted on the CDC website. All serious reactions to vaccines should be reported through this system, and you can see the table of injury compensation guidelines on page 1205 in your London textbook. Nursing assessment and diagnosis prior to giving vaccines is important. The nurse then determines the appropriate vaccines that are needed. Very often there are standing orders, and so the nurse then makes the decisions about which vaccines to give, which ones are appropriate at this time. By reviewing the child's vaccine record and using the CDC vaccine immunization schedule as a guideline. So we want to make sure we review and identify any possible contraindications that the child might have to getting vaccines. And you see those listed here. Any previous reactions um, that were severe, any allergies to vaccine components, a serious medical condition, uh, a child who's received blood products or immune globulin recently, or had vaccines within the past four weeks. All females then need to be assessed for the possibility of pregnancy. The nurse needs to then obtain informed consent from the parents. Um, with every vaccine, there's a vaccine information statement that is also accessible on the CDC website. So we should print out those sheets and go over the information with the parent, explaining risks and benefits for each vaccine, and teaching the parent about common local reactions to expect and home treatment that they can use. Parents do have the right to informed refusal of vaccines for their children, and so informed refusal is documented as well. To administer vaccines to children, um, be sure to always check the expiration date. Follow manufacturer instructions for each vaccine. Some vaccinations need to be reconstituted and the manufacturer gives specific guidelines for that. Using a long enough needle for IM vaccines is important to reduce local reactions on the skin. And we use many techniques for reducing pain and anxiety in the child. We'll talk more about those in the medication administration portion of this competency, so you'll see that in the other PowerPoint. Um, also, we're going to show the parent how to safely hold their child and support the child through the vaccines and give vaccines quickly so it doesn't take a long time and it's over, over pretty fast for the child. I put this picture in here specifically to show you a bad picture. Um, if you look at what the nurse is doing giving this injection, it's bad technique. The nurse's fingers are very close to the injection site as she's pulling out the needle. So when you're finished injecting the vaccine, move your fingers away from the injection site and then remove the needle from the child's arm. This nurse is at very high risk for having a needle stick injury because her fingers are so close to the needle coming out of the child's arm. A quick review of pediatric injection sites, and you studied this material in first semester skills. Children under two years of age, we will give their injections in the anterolateral thighs, so the vastus lateralis. So you'll want to review how to find that site in a child. 
In older children, we can use the deltoid muscle when it's large enough or the ventral gluteal site, but never in the dorsal gluteal. When we give vaccines, we need to have epinephrine on hand in case there would be an anaphylactic reaction, and we should also have resuscitation equipment. And on the bottom, you see the dosage for epinephrine for an anaphylactic reaction, and this dose can be repeated up to three times while we're obtaining emergency help. Documentation of the vaccines that's required, the date of administration, the vaccine that's given, the manufacturer, lot number, and expiration date need to be documented on every vaccine that's given. Also the site and route of administration, and the name, title, and address of the person administering the vaccine. So if you're giving the vaccine at your clinic or hospital, you can write that information in as an employee. We'll also vaccinate teenagers. Because vaccine prevention um, of communicable diseases has been very effective, many people nowadays are not aware about the illnesses and how devastating their effects have been in the past on children. And so I've included some slides here just as reminders to us about some of these devastating diseases that we are vaccinating against. And you will not be tested on this information. This is a child with polio that has affected her legs and her mobility. And this was very common before the 1950s when the polio vaccine was developed in 1952. Later, the oral polio vaccine was developed and it was found that polio virus was shed in the stool of the child who had the oral polio vaccine. So if the parents or other people around the child were not immune, they could actually contract polio from the child. This is a picture of several different children with diphtheria infection. And severe diphtheria infection causes lots of problems. Um, in both of these children, they have swelling of the lymph nodes in the neck. Um, you see conjunctivitis and infection of the membranes of the pharynx and that bull neck with the lymph nodes obviously swollen and severe myocarditis being the most, um, the most concerning reaction. This is a newborn with tetanus infection, neonatal tetanus, severe muscle contractures, and this infant did not survive. This is a picture of a child, an infant, with severe vasculitis and DIC with gangrene of the hand from a haemophilus influenza type B, or Hib, infection prior to the Hib vaccine availability. This is a picture of a child in day four of a measles infection rash. This child has the mumps and you see the swelling in the neck and the pre-sternal area. Mumps had, for some children caused deafness um, and this was much more common prior to the mumps vaccine. This is a newborn with a rubella infection, and you can see this child is very ill and very jaundiced. This child has chickenpox varicella infection with oral and skin involvement. This child had very severe case of chickenpox when the sibling who she got it from did not have it as severely. This is an infant or newborn with hemorrhagic varicella infection and this child died of disseminated varicella involving most of its organs. This picture is of a woman who has severe hepatitis B with hepatomegaly, severe liver enlargement. So the following uh, slides are several checkpoint questions for you to go over yourself. And so I will give you time to do that. And we will talk about any questions that you have in class. Thank you.